first speaker, uh, Alain, completed his MA in History at De La Salle University, Manila in 2003 and his Diploma in Archaeology at ASP in 2019. His published works include a wide array of interests such as sacred art history, funerary spaces, popular piety, and popular piety. He is currently an assistant professor in history at De La Salle College of St. Vidil. Let's all welcome Jose Alain Austria. Clap, Thank, you clap, very, clap. <laughs> Thank you very much, Grace. Yeah. Um, can you allow me to share my own presentation? Uh, where is it? I think... Good already. Ready? Yes. Okay. Anna, can we utilize the presentation that is it with your... Oh, um, sure. Uh, you can already share. Uh, no, I cannot share because the... Sharing button is, I think, disabled on your part. Oh, okay. Uh, let me just uh, give you a uh, co host status. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Our apologies. Yes, uh, yes. Ellie, can you? Yeah, I think it's working already. Working already? <clears throat> yes. Wait a minute. Okay. 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 So is it visible already? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So I'll count 15 minutes starting now, okay? Good morning to all of you. Uh, the cult of the Brown Madonna in early colonial Tagalog society, Spanish and indigenous interpretations. Um, with colonization came a new religion and with the new religion came new ways of seeing or visualizing the supernatural. And of course, we do have images in the case of the Philippines and the pre-colonial era. And of course, the new religion, Christianity, also brought with it its new iconography. But for now, we shall focus our attention on the concept of the black or the brown Madonna. In its traditional definition, the black Madonna refers to any European medieval European image of the Virgin Mary that is colored black, normally the Virgin Mary with child, colored black, brown, or whatever shade there is. And it was later on expanded to include all the predominantly brown images that were created by indigenous peoples in what is now the Americas and consequently the Philippines. So as long as it is from black to brown, whether it is carrying the child Jesus or not, it's considered as part of that mysterious trend of depicting the Virgin Mary as a dark-skinned woman. And this is also understood as one of the more powerful archetypes in sacred, um, sacred legends and in religion informal religion as well. And so we would like to focus our attention on the concept of the mysterious brown Madonnas of the Philippines. You see, the concept of the Virgen Morenita or the brown virgin is quite controversial in the early stages of colonization, primarily because Mary, which is just one person, is perceived to have several phases. On one hand, you have the colonizers who perceive her as one of them, their guide, their conquistadora, um, their, their connection with Spain, and an affirmation of the morality and the righteousness of their colonial venture. On the other hand, you have an indigenous population which sees the Virgin Mary as one of them, an Indio, she who affirms her indigenous 
her their indigenous Christian identity, and she who at times can even be a rallying point for resistance against the systematic oppression of the colonizer. Of course, they call this particular conundrum the Guadalupe conundrum, the virgin, the brown virgin of Mexico, meaning two different things to two different groups of people. And although she stayed there on and was venerated by both sides, eventually it reached the point that this became the symbol of resistance against Spanish rule. And this particular phenomenon is um, repeated again and again all over Latin America, in Mexico, in Uruguay, in Peru. And I am interested as to whether such dynamics are also applicable to the farthest outpost of the empire, which is the Philippines. In my decision to come up with the discussion of the Brown Manonas, I decided to focus on first 1571 to 1647 in the Tagalog region. This was roughly during the period wherein the conquista was starting up to 1647, when at least Spanish power was consolidated. In short, the colonization process was still ongoing and the first three generations of Filipinos uh, Christians were still very much alive, especially people who still have memories of the Tagalog region before the Spaniards entered the picture. So I chose three images, Nuestra Señora de Guía near Manila, uh, Nuestra Señora de Caizasay in Taal, and the Nuestra Señora de Antipolo uh, far away north in what is then Morong province. Let us talk first about the case of the, the Virgen de Guía. Now, the Virgen de Guía is the oldest Marian image in the Philippines. It's made of Molave, and it is an image that shows some Oriental features, which includes, among other things, a sarong or a tapis in her skirt. Um, she is a debulto statue, which means she's carved to be fully dressed, but she is bald, meaning um, her head was meant to really have a wig, which really points to the idea that this is indeed an image of the Virgin Mary. Where it came from or who made it, we don't know, but it was found by the troops of conquistador Miguel Lopez de Legazpi on May 19, 1571, just after the initial conquest of the polity of Manila. And they found her being worshipped, probably uh, as many people say, even as like a diwata or a poon, atop an altar made of pandan leaves and palm fronts. So when this was found, it was immediately hurled back to the metropole, which is now Intramuros, and they told them that this is a good sign. Um, this is, shall I say, a good symbolism, an affirmation from heaven that what we've just done is actually right, and she's here protecting us. Now, what's interesting about this cult is the fact that the Spaniards interpreted her pre-arrival, meaning she predated the Spaniards in this particular region as a way to prepare for their arrival. And that's why the Nuestra Señora de Guía, which is a title which is not in the Philippines, okay? It's a title that is known in Spain, was given to her because she's our guide and therefore it is indeed our noble task in conquering the Tagalogs for Spain. So therefore it became important for the Spaniards to, it is their moral duty to retrieve this particular image from pagan worship and that's how they called uh, Filipino religious practices at the time and to have her enshrined where she truly belongs, and that is a Spanish Manila. And ironically, though, in the indigenous interpretation, it appears that she, she is revered as some sort of a poon or a diwata. In fact, in the story, it appears that this virgin would, up, would be brought to the metropole in what would eventually become Intramuros, and then will find herself going back, will reappear, in what is now Ermita, the Spaniards would get her back again to the cathedral, she would reappear. And so the people would reinterpret as, hey, 
she likes it here. She doesn't like it there. She likes it the way she... And so eventually, this became a tug of war between the two groups until eventually the Spaniards gave in. Okay, we will have them there. Okay, she will stay there in Ermita. But, you know, we have to venerate her according to our own means. So in this particular narrative, there seems to be a form of subjugation. Yes, there is a tension on her understand on how she is to be understood. But what appears now is that eventually the Tagalog society eventually gave in to the Spanish way of doing things. And they start dressing her according to the Spanish mode of things, according to the Spanish tradition, because she is the Immaculate Conception. She's the patroness of Manila and what have you. However, the experience is not, this experience is not necessarily the pattern in other cults of the Brown Madonna in the Tagalog region. Sometime in 1603, a small image, again of the Immaculate Conception, which seems to be a favorite image in the Tagalog region, uh, was allegedly found along the Pansipit River in Batangas. And so this image was named the Virgin of Kaisasai because her epiphany, her discovery was supposedly accompanied by a big flock of kasai kasais or what we call a salaksak. In, uh, these are colored kingfishers. And so they named her after that particular sub, Immaculada Concepcion or Virgen de Kasai Kasai or eventually Virgen de Kaisasai. The image is also very, very small, roughly 10 inches. And it seems to be more of the Sino-Philippine style of craftsmanship. And she's similar to Kuan Yin, but more of the brown varnish with the reddish blue color. Now, it appears, again, that the narrative of the Virgin of Kaisasai is similar to that of Ermita. One thing, she always appears and disappears in a particular place. Apparently, people are saying, oh, the reason why she appears appears always in this place is because this is where she wants her shrine to be built. And that shrine eventually became the shrine at Labak. But what makes the Virgin of Kaisasai different is that long after its, its um, cult was established, is that there came a series of three to four apparitions. I would now use the term form, okay? Four apparitions that uh, happened between 1611 to 1619, and a fourth one will be recorded in 1639. All of them involving native people. All of them were investigated by the church. So this makes this the first investigated apparition claims in the Philippines. There seems to be no decision as to the supernaturality of the event, although there is an approval of faith expression, which now explains why the, the, you know, the well of Santa Lucia and all the other very early edifices there. Now, what's unique about these Marian apparitions is that they tend to be very archaic and the symbolism is so rich in local flavor. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to discuss it during the presentation. Probably later, some of you would like to ask the archaicness of these symbolisms. Okay, now apparitions, however, are quite very, very um, rare in the early stages of colonial rule in the Tagalog region. But what's interesting is that the story of the Virgin of Kaisasai seems to be similar to the foundling virgins of Spain and Latin America. And there's the prominence always of the elements of body of water, a cave, a tree. And this is already recognized as miraculous in itself. So this somehow would start a pattern. Practically every Virgin Mary or saint in the Philippines would be found atop a tree on the cave, retrieved from the sea or any body of water. And this is universally recognized as archetypal. But uh, Father Cruz, uh, the Jesuit historian, made a very good study of this in 2002. And took notice of the fact that in the case of the apparitions of the Brown Madonna in Kaisasai, there is a conscious overturning of the hierarchy wherein all the protagonists are particularly people who belongs to the marginalized class. Women, in this case, another, a slave girl, and in 1639, 
a Chinese guy who was actually one of the victims of the Chinese massacres of 1639. So it seems that in Kaisasai, the indigenous expression of faith seems to be more powerful or more obvious with the Lua, etc. And although it is under the watch of the Augustinians, it seems to be more tolerant of native expressions of faith, even syncretism, as in the case of uh, the Chinese Filipinos who would eventually join as members of the devotees of the Virgin of Kaisasai. But no other brown Madonna would uh, capture the attention of the Filipino or the Tagalog more than the Mexican Our Lady of Peace of Good Voyage. Now, what's interesting about this particular cult is that it was already, it was a cult that was introduced from above. And um, Monina Mercado in her study is very clear about this. It is a well-organized attempt to create a popular devotion on the part of the colonial elite. In fact, many people are saying that this is one devotion that came with so much hype. It is already popular even before it arrived in the Philippines. So this Mexican image actually was enshrined somewhere in Acapulco until Juan Nino de Tabora convinced the parish priest to sell it to me because I fell in love with it, uh, made it the patron of her gal of his trip, and eventually um, created a you know a, a very colorful reception for it in 1626. So it stayed in Manila for quite a while until his death, and later was given to the Jesuit missions in Antipolo. Okay, and it was then that she began to manifest specific miraculous uh, stuff, no apparitions, but she was known to be disappearing and appearing atop a tipolo tree, apparently saying that this is where she wanted her shrine to be in. Again, another commonality with the two other cases. But what's more interesting with Our Lady of Peace and Good Voyage is that no other Madonna figured prominently in socio-political upheavals, such as the Chinese rebellion of 1639, uh, the Dutch invasion of 1646, and even the siege of Cavite by the Dutch in 1647, than this one. So to some extent, um, Our Lady of Antipolo, from the point of view of the Spaniards, can be considered as the protectress of institutions and locales that play prominently in the geopolitical or economic life of the fledgling colony, the Manila Galleons, the Port of Cavite, the Navy, etc. So to some extent, she's also seen as the celestial queen or governor general of the Philippines. And that explains the, the, the crown and all the regalia, but more importantly, the importance of the governor general's baton, which is hiding, she is holding in her hand. In fact, it has become customary for some governor generals to literally surrender to her the conduct of government of the colony when things are really very bad. Now, she is also known to side with Spanish colonial forces when they are threatened by external elements, particularly by the Chinese rebels and the Dutch. And it is also interesting to note that it is the Spanish establishment which actually bestowed upon her the title Nuestra Señora de la Paz, even via Our Lady of Peace and Good Voyage. So to some extent, she is transformed into the most popular virgin of predilection of the Spanish, the somewhat like the Del Pilar of the Tagalog region. But somehow, the local population sees her differently. Among the Tagalogs, particularly the people of Antipolo, they are not interested in her. They simply call her Birhen ng Antipolo. They are not interested so much in her active involvement in political upheavals. For the Tagalog, she's revered more as a supernatural mother who is not concerned with political concerns, but more with domestic issues. I don't have food. Nalunod ang anak ko. Sasaktan ako ng asawa ko. If you look closely at the miracles of the Virgin of Antipolo as recorded from 1626 up until the 18th century, most of these are very, very domestic issues, which has something to do with the home and the family. Nothing 
profound as saving the country from an invasion or whatsoever. She is also revered as the health of the sick. And as everybody knows, every time the pilgrimage season enters the picture, most of them would describe Antipolo as the town of the maimed, the blind, the poor, practically all miseries associated with sickness can be found in Antipolo. Why? Because it is profoundly because she is the health of the sick. So for all its local color and pageantry, the devotion to the Our Lady of Antipolo among the Tagalogs tends to be very personal and intimate more than sociopolitical. And Our Lady, in their stories, she never appeared in an apparition, but she visits her people but only in the disguise of a Tagalog woman, either an old woman, a beautiful Tagalog woman, but always as one of us, sans all the supernatural elements. So it appears now when you look at all these stuff, these concluding thoughts are not necessarily conclusive because the study is still in its initial stages. But I want to end this with the following. The brown color of the Virgin did not have any racial connotations at all with both colonial Tagalog and Spanish masters. Uh, in contrast with that of Latin America, they don't see the brown color of the Virgin as anything racial or ethno-linguistic. It is just part of her mystique as an icon and the artistic license of the artist. Uh, there is a point in this history at this early stage that indeed Spanish devotees have a tendency to see these thriving cults as an affirmation of the righteousness of their colonial project in the Philippines. This is particularly true in the case of the Virgen de Gea and more so in the Virgen de Antepolo. But unlike their Latin American counterparts, none of these images eventually develop into a rallying point of what would eventually become later on as nationalist or anti-Spanish sentiments. There are no records of any image of the Virgin, regardless of form, brown or white, that's what you, that was utilized as an icon of resistance to colonial expression. In general, it seems that the indigenous ways of expressing faith in the Virgin were tolerated and even encouraged by Spanish missionaries, as long as these do not clash with Catholic dogma. But I do admit that there needs to be more research on this as to the role of religious congregations, regional differences, and specific personalities in shaping the character of the cult of the virgins I specified here in this research. So with that, I, include, I conclude my presentation on the cult of the Brown Manola in early colonial Tagalog society. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat po sa inyong pakikinig. Um, siguro unang tanong ay para kay Alain, mula kay Ramon de Leon. Um, this is the same motif detailing the actions and habits of the Virgen Candelaria of Silang and would her Chinese Filipino complexion mark her to be amongst the brown Madonnas as well? Elaine? Ah, we're you referring to the original one in Silang, the one that is shown actually in front of the church? Uh, I think that would qualify as one because many of the, um, the earlier images that were found uh, at least among the Jesuit churches in Cavite, have a tendency to be seen of Filipino and have a little um, dark complexion if you're going to compare it with uh, other images. So yes, it can qualify as such. I'm speaking here of the primitive image, not the image on the altar though. Okay. Um, yun ay galing kay Ramon de Leon at may pahabol siya, no? Meron po bang masasabi na ang birhen ng Antipolo ay tumigil ng ilang panahon sa isang simbahan sa Cavite Puerto bago din nila sa Manila at Antipolo. Well, birhen ng Antipolo po. Siguro <clears throat> after sumagot ni Alain, sasagot si Danim tungkol sa, dahil meron siyang komento tungkol sa birhen ng Antipolo. Okay. Yeah. With regards to that particular uh, scenario, no? what we do know is that the galleons would normally go to Cavite Puerto because it's the port. So doon muna yung dadaong. Okay, and certainly it would have stayed there. And then uh, 1626, then derecho sa Manila, where it stayed for several years. And then after Nino de Tabora died, it was transferred to Antipolo. And then when there was a rebellion in 1639, 
uh, the image was desecrated by the Chinese rebels. Uh, it was thrown in a fire where, and it did not burn. So in order to protect it later on, it was decided that it should go back to Manila and eventually to Cavite because of the Dutch invasion. And um, uh, it stayed in Cavite for roughly a decade, more or less a decade. And, and then eventually started its rounds in the Pacific. And then, bumalik yan oh. sa Antipolo. So, technically, ang Birhen ng Antipolo is a traveling image. It's, it's associated with Antipolo, but it's practically everywhere, in every place. No? It's, so, it's a constantly traveling thing. Although, what is what we are do, we are sure is that there is a certain sense of ownership on the part of the people of Antipolo. Um, every time they she would travel on a galleon or she would be brought to a place other than Antipolo is that you have to sign a contract. You have to sign a contract with the people of Antipolo and the parish priest that you promise that if you return safely, you are going to return this image immediately. Sabi nga ni Sir, no? they never called it a Nuestra Sir, they call it the Poon. Kailangan ibalik nyo yan because sa amin yan. Okay, so technically it stayed in Cavite for several years, um, but this was before the Soledad entered the picture. Okay, so many people are asking, so there were two patron saints in Cavite? No, um, the Soledad was not yet in the picture. It was not yet discovered when the Virgin of Antipolo stayed in Cavite way back during the Dutch Wars up until 1639 onwards to the 1640s. Okay, salamat Aline. Si Danim? Anong, sabi mo may komento ka tungkol sa uh, Birhen ng Antipolo? Sorry ma'am. Ah, yun po. Um, paano ba? Tama po yung nababanggit ni Sir na talagang maaari natin tignan talaga na yung... Kasi po, ang, ang pagkakaalam ko po, Jesuita, uh, ang Antipolo po ay sumailalim sa mga Agustiniano. Tama po ba, Sir? Ah. Franciscans first. Franciscans, sorry. Mm -mm. Or may, may kaugnayan yung dalawa dahil uh, dali, hindi, hindi ko matandaan kung ano. Anyway, ang, ang pinaka-trust po kasi dahil nga kilala yung simbahan, iglesia ng Pasig noon, sinasalubong po yan dito. No? At lalo na nung panahon ng digmaan after, after the war. No? at sa sa kamalayan no ng mga taga yung mga mga taga poblacion kilala kinikilala nga po yan bilang mutsa ng Pasig daw mm. dahil sa babae no na palutang na lumulutang uh, actually nakalutang sa no na sa ilog at kinakantahan no sinasalubong binibigyan ng pag uh, ng mga bulaklak no at bago iakyat sa sa Antipolo at may mga claim po talaga na halimbawa po yung pag-aalay lakad ay may kaugnayan din po doon sa na doon po sa sa poon no at siguro po magandang tignan din yung relasyon no um, kasi ang hirap po talaga ng historical research eh. sa, sa totoo lang po yung local studies ma'am uh, ma'am bar <laughs> ay po mahirap po talaga kumbaga di diskurso ka talaga from the outside forces and the need to have the possibility. So, alimbawa, yung pagoda, bakit may pagoda? So, influensya ito ng, ng maaring uh, venerasyon, ah, tama ba? Uh, transformasyon, konversyon ng mga insect no, na nagkaroon ng festive at may folklore ito no, uh, na kinikilalang uh, meron daw isang malaking ahas no, na lumabas uh, na walang ilog dati. Yan, yan. Tapos, ito daw ay demonyo sabi lumabas si San Prince si 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 ba to si San An, si, si Tolentino tama oo uh, nakalimutan ko yung 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 santo at upang uh, iligtas sila no ay magpa-convert sila sa sa Catholicism so kaya nung nagpa-convert daw po gumawa daw po ng malaking uh, daluyan at doon daw po nagsimula yung ilog pasig at bilang pasasalamat ay nagpista nga po, nagpagoda ang mga insect. Pero sa totoo lang po, ang paggaganyak ng mga palamuti sa, sa mga bangka o sa mga sasakyang pantubig, alamak na po iyan, way back. No? Yung mga badjaw po, yung mga lepa nila, ay 
may, may halos may kaugnayan na meron ng katutubong elemento. Pagamat siyempre, mahirap talagang mangangke ng kasaysayan dahil sa kakapusan <laughs> ng mga historical data po. Kaya po ma'am, sa akin particular, yung konsepto ng poon, dun ko po siya talaga pinapasok. Kaya nga po yung binabanggit po ni Sir kanina na yung pag Uh, yung pag-iitim, sabi ni Dr. Uh, De La Pazuzan, ito ay may kaugnayan sa likha no, ng Ifugao. Yung pag, uh, pag, pag yung di ba po may ritual ng kanyaw, ganyan, tapos yung bulul ay nilalagyan ng ng, ng, uh, ng dugo at kaya umiitim. At sabi naman po ni uh, National Artist Mohares, uh, statical po talaga na ginamit ang kulay na kayo mangki para magpalaganap, lumaki ang populasyon ng mga katoliko ng panahon ng uh, kolonisasyon. So, strategics po talaga. Thank you, ma'am. Sige, salamat, Danim. Um, dahil nabanggit mo yung kulay kayo, Manggi, may mga ilang tanong mula kay Kim Reyes at kay uh, na ipagsasamahin ko na no? at kay Rona, mula rin kay Rona Repangkol um, para kay Alain at maaring sumagot na rin si Danim dito. Ang tanong mula kay Kim ay, of the various sculptural depictions of the brown Madonna, are there examples where the dark coloration was applied later and not the original intention of the craftsperson? Contrary to that, do we know if brown Madonna sculptures that were created intentionally to have dark skin? Yung kay Rona naman, the, um, on the possible intentional dark coloration of the images of the brown Madonna, can we also... Uh, wait lang, nawala. <laughs> can we also consider the choice of wood materials of the time? That perhaps the available wood material for sculptures of the, uh, at the time were the only ones... Uh, wait lang, sorry. Wawala. Uh, so, for produces dark um, color that, para magkaroon ng dark skin. So, okay. Alain, yes. Okay, sige. I can only speak of the three cases that I presented, no? Let's go first with Mestra Senora de Guia. Okay, although I don't want ayokong pangunahan yung research ni Michael de los Reyes na ipapublish within the year. So, ngamuna ako doon, okay? But um, there seems to be evidence that the, 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 the one in Ermita, Mr. Senor de Guilla, had flake and stuff. Eh. So, the, you have the mulave, but there seems to be some chip of what we call um, lighter color because it is, there are, Images, remember all of these images are that of the Immaculate Conception. So uh, it's but normal na in the inkarnahan sila ng lighter color. So I think the the case of um, uh, the Our Lady of Nuestra Señora de Guia is that it seems to be polychrome first, lighter. But because of age, the patina has literally worn off and what we see is the brown molave thing. The case of Our Lady of Kaisasay seems to be similar because the polychrome is still strong. So I presume that the brown face is also uh, painted with the lighter color, but because of age, remember it's, it's submerged in water, etc. cetera. Uh, it probably stayed that way and most people prefer it that way, okay? The case of Our Lady of Antipolo is really intentional because the wood was, the wood that was utilized was preferred because It has a natural fine grain, and you will see that the Virgin of Antipolo does not have additional encarnas, etc. So it is intended to be that way. Very much like the Black Nazarene of Chiapo did not become black because nasunog siya or whatsoever. It was primarily dark in color because the wood that was utilized in Mexico was primarily dark in color. Uh, I am aware of specific cases, not in the Philippines, but in Latin America, of particular images that were deliberately painted brown or black because they associated with particularly those sedes sapiense, um, what do you call this, um, seats of wisdom 
images. Uh, for example, um, okay, nag-iisip ako ng Philippine example. Ah, yeah, the one in Bohol. Okay. Uh, if you're familiar with Our Lady of Guadalupe in Bohol, it's not the Guadalupe of Mexico. It harkens back to a black Madonna in Spain. So it is carved. When it was carved, natural wood, sempre blue. But there is a deliberate way to really carve it pitch black so that it could harken back to the memory of the Extremadura image that is found in central Spain. So there are cases which are like that. Now, there are some cases naman na maitim, you know, they know that it is dark and then they would paint it white because they would like to restore it. And this happened in the case of so many Black Madonnas in Europe, no? wherein they tried to restore it to its original look and its original look is not dark. I mean, it's um, lighter color. And the people get angry because they wanted it to be dark that way. And I believe there is also the same um, uproar when the Santo Nino was roared to its original Flemish look after centuries were in most Cebuanos are used to him, seeing him as a dark child. So marami mga possibilities na ganun. I think si Danny mas, marami, may masasabi din regarding this matter. Danny? Um, yes po, marami pong salamat. Nire-ref, pinabalikan ko yung article. Um, yun nga po, yung pag, um, well, ang tanong kasi masyadong positive is, no? masyadong interest is based on the material. No? Uh, ako po tumi- tumitingin po ako dun sa mga posibilidad no? uh, sa her- hermeneutics na um, yung pag-iitim at pag um, pag o oh, sabi ng brown madonna o black madonna um, gaya nga po nang nabanggit ko strategical din ito no para sa converse uh, conversion at transport hindi na wag na transformation conversion at paglilipat ng kaalaman no pero katutubo yung pagkilala na hindi nawawala yung mga nito ng paghihimala na may kaugnayan sa kalikasan Kasi alimbawa yung paggamit po ng kaya po ng linguistic play ko kanina, yung paggamit po ng ng puno ah, na matandang puno ay napaka ano po nito, no napaka ano yan at may mga ritual pang pinagdadaanan niya. Alam naman po natin sa archaeology bago po tayo mag-excavate, di ba? Meron po <laughs> pagputol ka diyan ng ano, meron kang mag magidil mag idildil ka ng uh, dugo or whatsoever. Ay pasasalamat pagkilala dun sa halaga ng mga espiritu mula sa kalikasan na ito ay maaaring tumawid no at maaaring sinakyan no ng um, ng katol ng simbahan kasi parang parang ano po diyan eh uh, sabi nga ni Dr. De La Paz may hidwaan talaga yung simbahan at yung mamamayan sa konsepto ng puon no syempre i-reaffirm no ng 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 mamamayan na kailangan namin kailangan ilabas ang poon. Kailangan namin makita yung imahe na, no, yung kanyang itsura, yung pagiging brown niya na nakikita namin yung sarili namin at bumababa ang Dios para doon. May ganung posibilidad po kaya may pagpapanata na iba yung iba yung turo ng simbahan, no? Na sa Australia nung uh, pagtingin ay napakatalamak po ito. No, kaya nga po halimbawa yung Moana no, na pinikula <laughs> ay napaka sorry po medyo nagkukulturang popular ako ay napakaganda pong ituro no yung mga mga paniniwala na brown no na brown skin at mel- very melanin no at syempre kinikilala natin na yung kahoy ay ginagamit na sa uh, strategia pero yung lalim no nung pananampalataya ay hindi mo ma hindi ma hindi mawawala no? kasi may mga may, may, may mga namamanata po eh may mga matatanda pa ring tradisyonal na paniniwala na nag-exist pa no bagamat tayo ay nasa moderno po mundo yan po thank you po Salamat Danim. Dahil nabanggit mo ang mga puno <laughs> uh, mula eh, John Marion Kapulitan para rin kay Alain no at kay Danim na rin um Does the prominence of trees in this finding stories can assume as can be assumed as remnants of ancient Tagalog beliefs on sacred trees groves? Or was it just a coincidence? Okay, Danim muna. Sige, Danim muna. Ito hindi ko po nakuha yung ano po, Greece po, sorry. Grove. Uh, ancient, 
ha, kung yung the prominence of trees in this finding stories kasi yung nabanggit ni Alene kanina uh, lahat yata ay ng mga nuestra ay nakikita sa mga puno uh, can can we assume that this rem these are remnants of ancient tagalog beliefs on sacred trees um yes po ma'am kasi wait lang po sa so, totoo lang wala naman pong sa, sa mito wala naman po sa pag-aaral ko po ng mito ma'am ha bagamat babae talaga yung nabivictimize sorry for the term <laughs> sa sa sitwasyon ng kasarian ay sa katutubong paniniwala po alam ba po yung buong yung, meron nga pong claim na itong San Sebastian din ay nakita din po sa sa puno na nagdiliwanag yun po palagi may liwanag at may puno eh lalaki po yun no na kung titingnan po natin na sa sa sa, 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 sa lumang paniniwala at sa School of Thought and Anthropology no na ang babae ay inuugnay sa kalikasan so yung imahe ay nagpo-produce ng mga ng mga ganitong um, mga ganitong paniniwala at ito po ay sa tingin ko ay universal no at ang tagalog po ay nandoon no at napakahalaga po kasi ng ilog no uh, upang maging daluyan no ng pagkilala ng mga mito ng mga himala ng ganyan pong mga paniniwala So halimbawa nga po itong Mariang Makiling at Mutya ng Pasig ay may kaugnayan daw po, no? May claim na ganun. So paano? Eh, kasi literal ang ilog at ang Laguna del Bai ay magkaugnay. No, may may transport kaya daw pong magbanyo, ay mag-transport ng okay? parang ng diwata, josa, no? Bumababa daw ang Mariang Makiling at nagiging serena. At siyempre yung mga ganito ay sumasakay sa ganung paniniwala pa rin no, na hindi na, na hindi po ma, maalis-alis no na na nandiyan pa rin po so essential na po kung uh, sa, sa, sa archaeology iba po kasi talaga yung pagdiskus ay po talaga ng datos no ito po ay nasa folklore po at yung papaano po gumaga gumagana yung lipuna sa ganitong paniniwala yun po yung pinagmumulan ko po thank you po salamat daning alin Okay, uh, I think it's both uh, applicable. Yes, it is reflective of pre-colonial uh, beliefs, particularly on the sacredness of trees and the tree as the um, as a haven for specific deities and spirits in the native religion. But at the same time, we recognize that what is seen in the the this native understanding of the sacredness of the tree is also universal because. In Spain, in Europe, in Germany, in France, in particular, you also have stories of Our Lady appearing atop the tree. The three cases that I gave you, uh, the Degia appeared atop a pandan. The, the, when the apparitions entered eventually in the Kaisasa, you know, it was found in the river, it reappeared on a Sampaga tree, Sampagita. And then finally, the Virgin of Antipolo, you know, it's a Tipolo tree, okay? And this seems to be highly consistent when you talk about the concept of Marian shrines, because up to the 20th, 19th and 20th century, even the more modern uh, accounts of Marian apparitions involve trees. Our Lady of Lourdes would appear on a cave above a rose bush. Um, Our Lady of Fatima appeared atop a whole milk tree. So it seems then there's even a cute uh, image of, in Germany called Our Lady of the Bramble Tree. What is it in a tree? Some people are saying now that probably this is a universal archetype of the, the divine feminine and the life-giving concept of the tree, the womb, and the water, uh, which are universal symbols of the feminine. And so I agree that while this is reflective of something very pre-colonial, it may also be reflective of something universal that all cultures share. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Um, marami pa rin tanong no, tungkol sa kulay ng mga Madonna. Um, mula kay, kay Prof. Rosela Torrecampo at kay uh, Mr. De Leon. Um, ngunit ibibigay ko yung ibibigahagi ko yung komento mula kay Prof. Omel Hernandez para sa dalawa. No? 
So sabi niya, sa paniniwala po ng mga tao, hindi siya ang pipili ng puno, hindi mismo ang puno ang tumatawag sapagkat nasa loob niya ang poon. Mm-mm. Yung kulay po, tungong brown, ay nakikita ko bilang natural na tendensiya lamang ng mga material na ginamit tulad ng marfil o kahoy. Mm-mm-mm. Sekundarya po ang kulay sa debosyon sa isang anito. Yes, definitely I agree. Okay. Um, Sige, mula naman kay Dr. Lineri para kay Alain. Majority of the Madonnas and their legends um, were recovered from a body of water. Have you considered the weathering process considering that these are wood and organic and might affect the color or the overall appearance of the Madonnas? Actually, Dr. Neri, one major issue here is just how, just how common or how real are these discovery stories because practically every Virgin Mary in the Philippines would claim to be, are claimed to be fished out of some particular body of water. Let's presume that it is true. Probably, yes, it might have some, um, it might have some effect on that, but we don't have real material analysis of these particular images as to the role of weathering in their particular uh, image. Uh, this is very different, say, in the case of, um, since you mentioned being fished on water, you know, Our Lady of Kaisasai reminds me so much of a similar image in Brazil, um, uh, the uh, Virgen de Aparecida, which is also the Virgin of a syncretist Afro-Brazilian religion, you know. In their case, however, they were able to, since um, it stayed in underwater for long and they were able to actually analyze it and even were a- able to identify where it came from. So apparently they knew the type of artist, the, the school. They knew that it came from somewhere in Paraguay and they knew that the dark color has something to do with the reaction of the muddy water with the clay. Uh, it's actually made of clay and all those stuff. We don't have that kind of so far as, as as far as I know, we don't have that kind of study yet um, in the Philippines. But probably, who knows? Uh, somebody might get an idea and study more on this. And uh, I would like to agree very much with what Dr. Rommel later on specified that yes, uh, there seems to be no the even at that time, whether it's brown or not, may not necessarily be a big issue for both sides uh, because it's but a natural part of um, either artistry or the natural color of the wood. So they don't see images as a realistic rendition of the supernatural being it meant to represent. They see it simply as it is, it's an image. Definitely we know that the Virgin Mary doesn't look like that, but we still revere it as it is. Okay. Um... Mula kay John Francis Torre para kay Danin, sa kulturang kapampangan, ang salitang apo ay para sa mga lolo at lola. Kadalasan nila itong ginagamit din bilang pagtawag sa mga patron ng kanilang mga baryo. Isa din po ito bang isa din po ba itong pagtawid ng sinaunang kultura sa relihiyong dinala sa atin ng mga Kastila? Naalala ko may kaibigan nga kami si sa ASP si Ryan Melendres. Apo, apo ang tawag niya sa mga sa mga kanyang alaga. Mga alaga niya. Uh, ma'am, well, tingnan ko natin Kapampangan, Pampanga, Ilog, Tubig. May mga remnants ng bakas, yung pagbabakas po ng mga uh, nananatiling katutubo, no? And Siguro sa akin po magandang tignan din particular pa, pa, paano yung pagpoproseso ng apo sa kanila mismo magmumula. No? Kasi po uh, makikita natin talaga dyan yung pagpapahalaga eh, na, na masasabi natin identity ng ako, identity, pagkakakilala ng, 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 ano, ng mga kapampangan. No? Uh, maingay po talaga sa kanila yung apo bilang pinagmumulan o ancestor o nuno o noo yan forehead no ng kanilang grupo may may kaugnayan po iyan yan po may kaugnayan po talaga yan no ang tagalog at kapampangan naman po ay na, halos saksisahin magka may ugnayan po sa isa't isa so ito po ay shared culture na natin sa isa't isa yan po salamat dan ay si ko yung apo kasi di ba ninuno nuno din hmm. so yes, maaring Tagalog po kasi ma'am yung ano ko ma'am Oo, ayos lang um, pero yung sinasabi mong shared culture ay 
baka doon natin pwede tingnan yung oh, pag-shirt sure. para sure. sa sure. yung apo at ulo. Opo, oh, mamin. Tsaka yung relative, relativism, baka po meron talagang specific particularity. No? Bakit siya nagiging apo talaga? Kasi yung kaibigan ko din po nga eh, apo malyari, apo ganyan. Tapos may kaugnayan daw ito na nagmula doon sa bundok ng araya, na bumababa. So these folk floors, shared ulit, <laughs> ay may kaugnayan sa isa't isa na ganun po. Kaya nga po halimbawa po tatanungin, bakit walang epiko ang mga Tagalog? Halimbawa, mapampangan, doon na lang po tayo sa mga poon. At doon po natin pag-ugnay-ugnayin ang story. Okay, salamat. Um, nais kong tawagin si Dr. Victor Paz na may tanong daw. Salamat, Grace. Um, may mga comments sa tanong. No? Um, una kay, kay um, Alain, no? very interesting paper of, uh, as always. Um, yung, agree ako no? the, the, sa lahat ng observation tungkol sa Baka itong, kahit doon, limit lang natin doon sa tatlo uh, na phone, uh, ay, uh, at sinabi mo naman, painted originally. Ang, uh, sa akin, ang glaring dyan, yun, ano, eh, yung ilong. If, um, wala naman sa kalilang pango, di ba? Uh, all, all of them have aquiline, di ba? Aquiline. Yes, and, 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 and so, really, yung, yung color is secondary, you know, doon sa... Mm-hmm. And and reminds us of now yun bagong thinking na di ba about the classical statues na kala natin were all white when now uh, with the material studies I demonstrated that lahat sila were garishly kala mo mga pinoy nag uh, nagpintura no very uh, <laughs> colorful yes, all yes, of yes. these classic uh, Greek uh, and Roman statues so um, which then brings me to the point that uh, is moot. We, uh, wala ang difference really do sa itsura nung perihen uh, yung who, who venerates them eh. Diba? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it cuts across. Kasi the veneration comes from the venerators eh. Not, mm-hmm. not, not um, from the enemies. Uh, so they, it, it is uh, incorporated by everyone. Diba? Uh, and, and they have their own meanings. No? Okay, thank you. So, may iba pa tayo ah, katong... Oh, yes, pala. Na- nakalimutan ko sabihin. Um, Alain, mm-hmm. balikan mo nga si Ricky Jose at uh, Vite Villegas. Yung libro nila, di ba, yung santo? Oh, Ayan, oh, oh. Yung... Hmm. If I recall w- w- correctly, they explained that the flowing... Uh, uh, pag-flowing yung robe, it is a Chinese artistic uh, rendition. Yes, yeah. So, um, so yung kay, kay Saisai, baka... Seems to be the, Chinese. Seems to, because of the robe, di ba? Uh, you would know because of the tilt. Yung parang sa Kuan Yin, uh, may tilt ng konti. Uh, yung cloud, spiral ang motif. Uh, uh, Tapos, ang tendency is that yung, yung, kanyang, yung hem ng kanyang robe, yun yung tinatawag nilang clamshell motif. Yes. Para siyang, yeah, in, imbis na natural fold, para so, siyang clam. So obviously, kay Sasai might be called in the context of Sino Filipino. Your artisanship. No, artisanship is Chinese. Uh, I'm sorry, just to clarify, the clamshell motif is Chinese. The yung, yung so, robe, yung sa robe, yung, yung flowing, sa, oh, yung, yung, okay, yung, okay, yung hem okay. ng robe, yung hem ng robe niya. In business, a Western style na makikita mo na it naturally falls down, tapos may pa. Ang tendency is that para siyang clamshell motif. You coined that term. No, I got it from from Pero the okay. Filipinos ang gumawa. Mm-mm. Yung, yung sa ano, they Filipino? saw they saw the same pattern in Our Lady of Piat. Pag tinanggal mo yung damit. Okay. Ano ang so Filipino craftsmen ang gumawa. Chinese so, Filip more likely Chinese Filipino Chinese, school. Chinese or, or Chinese na nakatira dito. Oh, then, gusto ko lang kasi yung clams are important also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kasi ang hirap i-discuss, paano ba ito, uh, Grace? Yung kanyang hemline, di ba? Yung yeah, meron, I can imagine. Yeah. Ta- yeah. Pero ang ano niya is pag anon, yung unnatural, yeah. para siyang clamshell na. Yeah, kasi may mga, makikita mo yan sa mga grave, yung ibang grave markers or ibang, may mga uh, image ng Virgin Mary nakatayo sa actual, hindi actual clam, pero... Ayun, uh, ang ganda nung sin- shells talaga. Yeah. Thank oh. you kay Ryan sa kay Ma'am Tore Campo, scallop hemline. 
Ayun. <laughs> for the for better term. No? Okay, Sorry. hindi ka. Scott, thank you very much po. Okay. Iba talaga pag may magsasanto dito yung mga kamarero. Okay. Uh-huh. Kamusta okay. na lang sa family ni Ryan? The better family. Okay. okay. <laughs> I see. Uh, wait. Uh, sandali lang po. May mga questions pa tayo dito na Okay, Doc from Dr. Juan Rofes. Um, he is asking regarding the Saint Ro- Santa Rosa de Lima because when he was in Peru, uh, he was um, told that the patron of Lima and the Philippine Islands was Santa Rosa de Lima. But when he reached the Philippines, uh, he inquired and doesn't know anything about, no one knows about Santa Rosa de Lima. But I told him in the chat box that Santa Rosa is the patron saint of Santa Rosa Laguna. Um, any more? Maybe Alain or Danim can add to the answer. Well, the choice of uh, patron saints for Manila and the Philippines is primarily that of the Spanish. So when they cho- the choices of the patronesses include Santa Potenciana, barely known to the Filipino, but she's a patroness of the Philippines, uh, Santa Rosa de Lima. But again, apart from Dominican areas where she is known, uh, hardly anybody knows who Santa Rosa de Lima is. Okay? But um, so secondary, patro- secondary patron. No? So apparently it has something to do also with who chose the patron to begin with, because in the early stages, the choosing of patrons or sec- is not done through acclamation, but rather it's done probably influenced by the personal preferences of the bishops or the higher ups of the Spanish church in the Philippines. It's not something that that passes through what's uh, like a plebiscite among the people. So definitely it's different. Of course, the principal patroness is the Mary as the Immaculate Conception. And you're going to notice that all the three cases that I presented to you are interestingly Immaculate Conception images. Uh, all right, thank you. Um, we should have stopped like 20 minutes ago, but we are having a lively discussion and I think uh, the people are... Arsenio has are, a question. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I was like, segue lang ako. <laughs> na, <laughs> na people would, uh, are still interested to, to extend this. So yes, may I call on Arsenio? Hi, Alan. Kumusta? Kumusta, sir? Long time no see. <laughs> ang, ang tanong ko sa iyo ay eh, yung bang mga imahen ay singkit <laughs> pag Chinese. Well, I was talking to Dr. Uh, Jose regarding this matter, no. It's an issue of whether kailangan ba pag sino Filipino ang ay singkit. Merong iba na singkit, no. But you must understand that, you know, the Chinese are also capable of adjusting to particular modes, no. Uh, remember when they are creating these santos, most of them also have models. Most of them, in most cases, Flemish models. No? So, hindi naman necessarily na kailangan since sino-Filipino ang craftsmanship, sino-Filipino din ang mata. No? Not necessarily. Because there are so many ivories made and of sino-Filipino school na hindi naman singkit. Pero may mapapansin sila ng mga particular patterns na unique sa Buddhist iconography. Like um, medyo flat ang ulo yung medyo malalaki ang tenga, yung parang sa Buddha, no? Um, yung fingers medyo malakandila, mga chabi-chabi fingers, mahahaba. Okay? Parang sa Thai. Parang sa Thai, okay, may papansin nila doon. The lips are normally very small. Tapos ang preference ng Chinese, di ba, swerte sa babae, ang bilog ang muka. You will notice that too, okay? But not necessarily forcing it to the point na kailangan, since Chinese to, Ch- kailangan Chinese na Chinese din sila. Because, Remember that even in Guangdong, even in parts of southern China, there are artisans which are actually making images of the Virgin Mary specifically for the colonial market. No? So they knew very well na hindi pwedeng singkit-singkit to because ang market natin is European, Filipino, Macanese, etc. So basically, uh, may mga iba na singkit, may mga iba na hindi, but ang tinitingnan karamihan, particularly Dr. Jose was very, very clear about this, ang tinitingnan niya is yung mga motifs like ang hair ba, paswirl, mm-hmm. merong, yun yung know, gata, ang kulot ba may pagka-spiral. <laughs> Doon niya tinitingnan eh, yung kamay, yung belly ng baby, okay? 
yung mga ganong mga bagay, tinitingnan nila yon. Now, uh, it's also interesting to note that it's not always the Chinese Kuan Yin which is influencing the Mary. In fact, there are studies now which suggest that's the other way around. Uh, prior to the arrival of Christianity in Macau in the Philippines, Kuan Yin is always depicted as a single woman. Mag-isa lang siya. But because there is a market in the Philippines, in Macau, for the Madonna, meaning the Virgin and Child. Nagkaroon na rin ng bagong iconography si Kwan Yin, wherein may dala siyang batang lalaki no? with, the role, with the idea na ito yung Kwan Yin na tagapagbigay. E kung gusto mo magdasal kay Goddess of Mercy, you can do so. But bakit kailangan may daladalang batang lalaki? Di ba, in Chinese, a boy is preferred over the girl. And if you wanted to have a son, pray to Kuan Yin. And so, nakikita mo that the influence is two-way. One influences the other, and the other influences the other. So it's not a passive influence, but rather it's a give-and-take relationship between the two schools of art, of sacred art. May, Thank may you, sir. Pa. Alam mo ba may mga imahe ng mga Chinese ladies na natatagpuan na lang sa dagat. Pagkatapos mm-hmm. ng mga insect, uh, uh, they, na, they build shrines in honor of these images sa Manila. Yes, yes. Definitely. Hindi lang sa Manila, sa buong uh, kapuluan, sa mga, sa mga dagat. You know? mm-hmm. If you're familiar with Kaisasai, Kaisasai is probably the one that reached uh, what we call... Um, Syncretist levels. Kasi uh, in 1639, the alleged apparition to Haipin, he's a Chinese mm. laborer who was one of the victims of a supposed massacre in 1639. No? Um, they approve of it. But it's awkward no? after mong patayin, approve mo yung apparition that saved this Chinese guy from you Spaniards. No? But it was approved. Pero sa kanyang understanding, no, ang Virgin of Kaisasai is Matsupo, who is actually the Taoist deity of the China Sea. And so when you go there on December 8, may mga Chinese din na pumupunta doon because they believe that Our Lady of Kaisasai is a Christianized manifestation of a Taoist deity. So, um, in fact, nas- nalulungkot kami kasi yung isang temple dyan sa may Santa Ana ay unti-unti nang na- nasisira. Yung sa tapat, sa likod ng simbahan ng Santa Ana sa, Lam- sa, Namay- uh, sa Lamayan Street, no? Kasi namatay na yung last caretaker na hati-hati na at medyo nagde-deteriorate na. But that is also a shrine dedicated to the Virgin Mary as Matsupo or Grandma Buddha of the Seas. Isn't the one in Cavite City also found in the sea? Uh, uh, Soledad, yes, uh, allegedly. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Malawak lang ating ano talakayan lang. Yes, yes. I I hope that all the papers presented in this conference will be published soon. Soon, hopefully okay. after yeah. the pandemic. At uh, <laughs> <laughs> Para kay Damien sana ako ay makakapagsalita ng Tagalog katulad ng Tagalog mo. Napakaganda. Mm-hmm. Okay lang po. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, may tanong tayo mula kay Dr. Michelle Eusebio. Um, tanong niya para kay Dalin at kay Alain, yes. meron din ba sa Tagalog region na lumalaki na Birheng Maria? Kasi uh, may isang nagtanong no, kasi sa Haro Iloilo, yung Our Lady of Candle ay pinaniniwala ang lumalaki daw. So, ito ba ay uh, lore to our children of faith or meron bang ibang beliefs uh, across the Philippines tungkol sa ganito? Ako, ay, ano ba? <laughs> Ako muna po. Oh, sige, danim po. Bibigay ko na po. Kasi mo meron, uh, hindi po sa Pasig po, meron po hindi uh, hindi sa ina, hindi sa Mary o Maria, kundi ito po yung san, um, Santo Poong Santo Santa Cruz. So na sinasabi po sa folklore, mali daw po yung cross na tagpuan daw po ng mga magsasaka sa daang kalabaw. Tama ba? O daang kalabaw ba kay sa kwento ng nanay ko at mga mga lola. Kasi po natira po sila malapit po dun sa pulo o sa San Santo Tomas na magkalapit po dun sa barrio. Sa paniniwala po na lum, lumaki daw po yung poong Santa Cruz at doon po na-establish yung pagtatayo ng barangay. 
na itong Santa Cruz po ay napakaliit. Kung tawagin nga po nila ay uh, bunting kalsada, yung kanyang old name. Kasi po, isang major street lang po siya no, na naghahati doon sa Santo Tomas at oh, yung pinakaduluhan po ng, wala kasi tayong mape, <laughs> uh, duluhan po ng uh, San Nicolas. Yeah, yeah, po. So, wala sa dito po sa Pasig o sa mga inisyal ko po, yung lumalaki po, yun po yung claim na, po, na meron po sa amin na mula sa maliit ay lumaki daw po ngayon no? at hinuugnay po yun sa politika nga din po na nagtayo po ng barangay dahil sa ganun at ang nakatagpo daw po ay kasama o magsasaka na, na nagtatanim ng palay ng mga palay sa dating um, daang kalabaw Yan, kung tawagin po umunting kalsata so may ano na naman pong alam niyo na konektasyon ulit ng pangkaraniwang tao at poon ang tawag po nila yan poong Santa Cruz yan yun po marami pong salamat wala po dun sa ano sa lumalaki po siguro po baka po may may kaugnay may kaugnayan po siguro tignan din po dun sa pag-establish po ng pag-expand din po ng kapangyarihan ng simbahan okay thank you okay Grace Alin? yeah um Nasabi niya na yung mga Santa Cruz no. May napansin silang pattern no. Pag simula sa Central Luzon, Pampanga, pababa hanggang Tagalog region, patungo hanggang Kabikolan, may wala tayong masyadong naririnig na lumalaking imahe ng birhen tulad ng Candelaria sa Haro no. Uh, bagamat may mga storya siguro na ganoon na hindi natin nalalaman o hindi natin nare-research. Pero may lumalabas na pattern, ito yung mga lumalaking cruise kasi mismo sa Binondo may ganyan, okay? Mga lumalaking cruise, pattern 'yan. Nasabi na yan ni Danem. Eh kalawa, yung lumalaking Santo Sepulcro, yung Kristo na Santo Entierro na patay na nakalagay sa urna na hin- eventually hindi na magkakasya kasi lumalaki, lumalaki, lumalaki. And this story seems to be consistent from Central Luzon up to what is the now Camarines Sur kasi meron doon amang hinulit which is the same nagsimulang maliit lumalaki nang lumalaki paano nila nalaman lumalaki kasi hindi nakasya do sa case so lalaki 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 at lalaki and most of them has something to do with this dead Christ the cult of patay na Cristo Christ lying in state nagsimula siya maliit actually sabi ng iba nagsisimula bilang kahoy lamang tas unti-unti nagkakaroon ng paa, muka, kamay until nagiging fully developed lumalaki at inaalagaan in the same way as a real human being. Uh, I personally encountered that when we did a study on the Kalabanga uh, among Hinulid but um it seems to be typical of the southern Luzon area. Thank you Ali.